Okay, for tonight's demo, we have uh, Keith Lauterbach, a longtime club member, who's going to be demonstrating uh, ornament turn for tonight. It's really thin, you know, turn. Okay. That's what everybody wants to see. How I do these thin videos. Yes, as the ornament to play Can I just make a, a, a question? Yes. We've only left half an hour for Keith's demonstration, and I have no problem staying over. I don't know if John I'm good. is fine with just extending the meeting beyond nine o'clock. If people want to leave at nine, that's fine. But I'd like to give, let Keith have the time to do the demonstration properly. But. Yeah, absolutely. And the guys out there in Zoom land will stick in and out to suit them anyhow. You know, they all fall asleep right now. Yeah. You can tell them also. I'm going to send you a PDF file that's, that you can put up. That's fine. Yeah, we'll post that. We'll, 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 Do you mind it post or you just want an email? Do you mind it posting on the web? Or would you I don't care whether it's yeah, We'll okay. post it along with the video. When I first talked to Ben, um, we had talked about turning finials, and and <coughs> generally the questions that are asked: How do you do thin finials without breaking them? I'm going to share with you tonight how to do that. Um, but first of all, um, one of the things that um, a lot of folks who who turn often wonder is, well, I'm turning this finial or I'm turning these finials. How do I, how do I design them? Um, there's an interesting book written in 1948, I'll remember, um, by Burl Osborne. And uh, you'll think, well, that's pretty irrelevant, but it's really not. In fact, um, he has um, um, a definition of what design is, and I've given it to you on this handout. Designing is a process of seeing the need. Well, if you're turning a finial, finial for an ornament, you have a need. Uh, analyzing the function, knowing the materials, understanding the process of forming, and then put all these steps together, develop a sensitivity for beauty. So if it looks nice, probably a good design. And, and the other thing you can do is check Mother Nature because um, these things are out, or real accurate design is out in Mother Nature. Um, one of the things that I try to do also, and it's a pretty interesting uh, to follow is, um, how we get to a design. If we'll go and look at this for a moment, All right? This is just a finial. In fact, I have uh, that finial is right here. If we simply took a piece of wood, put it between centers and turned it, you might get some smooth curves, irregular curves, the real, and it, there's a couple of real simple steps to design. When you do a curve, okay, here's a curve that comes out, it changes directions right here. So when it changes directions, it's okay. There's one curve, there's two curve, called an irregular curve. Also, if you have a curve or an irregular curve, irregular curve in a good design only happens one time. In other words, coming down this way to this way, at this point, we can't or should not make another irregular curve without an interruption. And that interruption can be a number of things. It could be a bevel. Let me see this. It could be a bevel, it can be a round, it could be a shoulder, it could be a code. They're pretty, pretty simple elements to change directions. 
to make a design look appropriate. Um, <clears throat> these are a couple of plates. And I, I do this when I look for design other than just going out into mother nature as well. Um, this is some actual architectural uh, design for turned work. And this was uh, from the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. Hmm. Guess what? Those designs and those elements <coughs> Uh, those elements are still appropriate today. So what I do is I take a look at look at elements like this and come up with my designs. And I know many of you, um, I'm not certain how you all design, but when I design anything to turn, even a wall, I sketch out what I think the final design is going to be, I think. Again, that depends on, depends on the material. So here are a couple examples of things. And every time I make a finial, uh, whether it's top or bottom finial, I sketch it out and I maintain a sketchbook. Now, the other thing that's difficult also to, um, to do and to achieve is to know and understand or figure out. And I'll just ask you, does, does the top and bottom finial on this look okay? That's your question. Does it look okay? I think it does. Yes. Why do you think it does? What makes it look okay? There's no repetition. You're repeating the shapes. Okay, top repeating and the shapes, top and bottom. And again, if you look on your handout, there's a number of different ways to incorporate those different shapes, um, different element variations, repetition of shapes. And I just gave you an illustration of what it would look like on a spindle. Uh, but you don't need to use um, all of those. Um, reduced repetitive shapes. So if you have a shape, um, if you have a shape that's uh, uh, like the third illustration there, the elongated shape, if you'll notice the very shape on top is much smaller, but it's similar in shape as well. And the ones on the right are, again, those design elements that I talked about, changing of. Is the repetition then at the top, very top where your string is, and then the bottom, where does it repeat on the bottom? The only repetition of shape on this particular one is this, this globe part right in here. Okay. All right, the glow part right in there. Um, there's some other ones. Here's a much better illustration of the, the first. Yep. Olive wood, certified olive wood from Bethlehem, Israel. And because it's Christmas season, uh, the other thing that I do when I make ornaments they're pretty, they're pretty personal to me. Um, a lot of people get an expression out of wood when you turn an object or something. Uh, when I turn, it's Christmas time. So this is a special time because this is when Christ was born. And if you're a Christian, this is when Christ was born. So this ornament represents Christ to me. Bethlehem, Israel is a body. The top and the bottom is made from holly, which is pure. That's the whitest wood, one of the whitest woods you can get. Now, I can show you another example. Here are two examples of holly. All right. 
Just while you have those examples, can I ask a question about design? Certainly may. When, when you've got that half shell appearance on the top on, on the ball, yes. Does the symmetry between top and bottom become less important? Um, it does to me. Okay. Because what I typically don't do is I typically don't. Um, this is one of my rare ones. Yeah. That actually uh, has taken the design from the top and the bottom that are similar. If you look at a lot of mine, you know, there's really no relationships with the top and the bottom finial. Okay. okay. Now, the holly that was pure white, for those of you who are sawing trees down, and I saw trees, I used to saw trees. Um, you'll notice that there's a difference in color between these, these hollies, the one on, the, on my left and the right. And the difference is when they were cut. The one on the right, you can see, has a little bit of gray in it. The sap was up in the wood. That was cut in December. I know because I cut the tree. This one was cut during spring, between the end of January and no later than the end of February. And you'll see that it's pure white. Um, so when you're looking at different woods or to cut and particularly holly, you'll want to know that or want to remember that. Here's an interest. I'm sorry, Keith. Are you going to get the same kind of differences or subtle differences with the like a black walnut? Or <clears throat> that's very difficult. To, I black walnut has to do with where it grows, whether it's northern Lancaster County or whether it's southern Lancaster County or whether it's eastern Pencil. It it has to do with the you know the minerals in the soil. Um, but those colors are not going to change that much. But one of the other things, uh, there were a couple, um, there was a bowl here tonight, natural egg bowl. If you want to make certain that that bark stays on when you cut it, when the sap's out of the tree, not when it's up in the tree. So when the sap is out of the tree from that January to the end of February, that's the time that you want to cut it. And I can guarantee it, that bark is going to stay on. And I can take any piece of wood and put on the lathe if it has bark on it. And if that bark comes off, I know it wasn't cut during the winter. It was cut during uh, spring, summer, or fall. Um, let me just sidetrack a moment. This is an interesting ornament. Um, in fact, this is a historical ornament. Uh, and the history behind it is the, the body of it is, is called Parthion walnut, which is not native to the United States. It's native to Ukraine and some of those uh, Eastern or Eastern uh, European countries, but typically Ukraine in that region. This particular piece was actually cut down behind Franklin the Marshal on a, a, a fellow's property. Now, how did it get there? Back in the 50s, <clears throat> there was a representative from the United States to an ambassador to Ukraine. And when he came back, he put a couple seeds from the tree in his pocket, from the fruit of the tree. And they were planted, and that's how it got here. <laughs> um, so the different ornaments um, have, again, different meanings. Stauffer Mansions down in Lancaster, Spalted Maple. Um, believe it or not, the finials on this are Osage Orange. And that Osage Orange 
was cut down in 1946, if my memory serves me right, about in that area, I think 46, when the Conestoga Country Club was being built, they needed more land uh, for the 18th Green. So what they did, they had a lot of Osage orange trees on that property down along the Conestoga River at the 18th Green. So guess what happened? They cut them down and buried them. They buried them to make the 18th Green. They got uh, <laughs> some of the ground uh, from the Conestoga, but they covered it up. And that's what the 18th Green is. Uh, <clears throat> when they redesigned the 18th Green, they dug up that wood. And that piece of wood came from there. So that's why it's not typically your typical Osage orange. Again, most of my ornaments, I like to, uh, I like to have a, some history behind it. Now, one of the other things, because of the, the transitions, we I talked about the transitions, and I gave you a handout, and on the back of your handout has to do with an explanation of the, uh, the golden ratio. Now, you don't have to do or use that precisely. If you want to know, for example, what relationship should this piece be in relationship to the longer piece of the finial? Well, here I have my overall length of the finial. And I believe if I can, I think it's about three and three eighths. So if we divide three and three eighths by the golden ratio, 1.618, we will come out with uh, that relationship here. So again, from here to here in relationship to that, that's a good relationship. So when you say it looks good, you're probably saying that relationship based upon the overall length and that proportion of the golden ratio, that's what makes it look good. So when you say, well, that looks good, that's what we're talking about. Now, I <clears throat> do I sit down and figure all this stuff out when I do that? No. But what I do do, take this, and I'll typically, in my head, in my head, divide this length out and get this relationship. And then in the smaller one, I do the same thing. And you'll notice there's some teardrops in here. And those, whether they're short on top or long on bottom or vice versa, it doesn't matter. As long as the relationships uh, are there, uh, that's what makes it look good. Now, there are some other resources. In fact, tomorrow night, uh, I believe at the wood turning store online for $30. You can see Cindy Droz that she's going to do finials and Christmas ornaments tomorrow night for $30. So if you want to go on there, you can pay 30 bucks and see her as well. Or you can stick with us tonight and see it for free. Or you can stick the knife. And I'll, sh the <laughs> and I'll show you how to uh, sharpen. Um, A gouge, Cindy draws the gouge. I'll show you how to do that. Um, the other particular reference that I want to share with you tonight, uh, it's about a year ago. And most of you are members of AAW. You probably have seen this particular article about the umbrella ornament. It was really interesting. I did this ornament last year without reading this article before I even saw it, because every year I have or typically try to design a new ornament, new design. Uh, one year, um, one year it was my inside out turning. Um, I'm 
one year at Snowman. Now, again, that's put together with four pieces, Ebony, Polly, and you'll notice there's repetitive design at the top, and then I have a small snowman at the bottom. The other ones, the other ornaments I did are, are sea urchins, and these sea urchins have come from, again, the South China Sea. In fact, I served in the service over there, so I actually picked some of these up. I didn't bring them home, though. Um, um, so sea urchin, top and bottom ebony. And again, this is a different sea urchin from the same area, different size, um, top and bottom out of ebony. Now, when I do these ornaments, I actually use a skewer that used for sticking vegetables and meats on your grill. And I actually drill a hole. I actually drill a hole in the bottom finial. And I actually drill a, a hole in the top of the finial. And then put the skewer between. And that maintains the correct pressure on the ornament. So when, you act, when, you, when I glue them together, um, I don't break them. And I brought up a small urchin along. And what I do is I made a mandrel that I wrap a piece of abrasive paper around and I enlarge the, <clears throat> the hole in the bottom. I very carefully drill a hole in the top and then um, enlarge it with the same mandrel as well. So I get a nice circular hole. The other more ornament set I, I typically do, this is a piece of olive wood as well. Um, I typically start out with a three inch piece, inch and a half, or about inch and three quarter, inch and five eighths square by about three inches long. And I'll show you uh, same concept as I use when I do my finials. Um, I can tip it, I try to get two bodies out of that one piece, a little over three inches long. Um, and I drill a hole, I will measure I will measure off, and again, this is a little larger than, this is an inch and five eighths, I believe. Yeah, inch and five eighths, I will measure from the end of the finial over to this end, it should be one inch and five eighths. I will drill a hole and leave one eighth of an inch without going through the, the body. Now you're probably wondering why I do that. Well, I sand this once I have it shaped. Once I have it hollowed out on the inside, I sand it, just finish sand it. And then I'll actually finish rounding this part off uh, after I continue to drill through the body. If I drill it first, and if I am not careful, I can cut that hole body right off. So I, I make an extra step out of it. The tools that I use for the body um, to hollow out the body are these two tools, um, whatever I feel like that day. Uh, this tool I made out of an Allen wrench. And uh, it, it's pretty effective because it gets in, as you can see, I can get in real close inside the whole way back to the very back. Just, and the hole that I'm using there is a quarter inch hole, quarter inch hole. Now, if you'll notice the one on the other side is larger, 
Usually what happens when I'm hollowing, this tool kind of enlarges that hole just slightly in order for me to get that thinness in there. And I try to get it to be around an eighth of an inch, the hole uh, from top to bottom and side to side. Quick question. How do you evacuate the chips when you're hollowing something? Um, there's a couple ways you can do it. If you're really making a lot of these at one time, um, the air compressor and blow it out. Okay. Or I have a, <clears throat> a clear tube that I have left over from my vacuum pump that I made. So I just blow it out and, and they'll blow right out. And again, um, if you keep this turning and you're blowing, the chips will stay in. You got to stop the lathe and then blow the chips or they'll stay inside. Most of most of them. You'll get some of them out, but most of them stay inside. Um, so that's generally how I look at design, how I use design in designing um, these ornaments. Now, this article did talk about the umbrella. And this is a, a good, if you've never turned and if you're new to turning, this is a, a really, really good. And, and the gentleman that wrote this article, it's pretty thorough. I do some things a little differently than he does, but if you follow that, it's uh, you'll you'll have pretty good success, I believe. And this is what you need to do. It's not that difficult. You start out with a piece of wood, <clears throat> and again, this is historical wood. This comes from a church property that was donated to the church over a century ago. And they still hold evangelistic services there. So I got and um, the ash, the ash board uh, killed many of the stuff. There. So I got some branches from up there. And again, whatever that diameter is. This one typically, this is two and a half. I usually do not use more than a three inch diameter piece. So three inches, I typically make it more than three inches. Um, you can make it, if it's three by three, you can do that. And I typically will make it three. If it's three by three and a quarter, put it on the bandsaw. Now you'll notice as well, I did this intentionally. I didn't cut it exactly even. Uh, and what you will notice, if you'll look at the uh, examples of the designs over here, uh, you'll see that some of these are, have a bigger hump, have a larger curve or wider or smaller. That's what you'll get with naturally the different sizes of these. So you cut it in half, and I'll explain this. I'm not gonna show up, demonstrate it. I didn't bring my other truck. Um, and you do this, you set it up exactly the same. If this is my head stock, tail stock, put the flat end, which, what, which direction? Actually pull. Yep. Are you going to make a tendon or something? What is it through? No, what, I, I, I'm going to make a natural edge bowl. So, so the flat end goes toward the tail stock, the round toward, or toward the head stock. And I turn it, and I also turn a tendon on it. So this is what it looks like. Right? This is what it looks like when I turn the shape and the tendon. And again, that tenon can be small, can be large. Here's another one that I turned that the tenon is different size. And you'll notice the piece that this started with was about this size as well. All right, once you have the tenon on it, what do you do? You flip it around, chuck it up in the headstock. chuck it up in the headstock, hollow it out. And once it's hollowed and I sand it, 
Then I drill a hole in the center. Now, why would I not drill a hole in the center at this stage? Why do you, what, what do you suspect? I didn't drill a hole in the center right here. You're going to weaken the tenon. You're going to weaken the tenon. And trust me, if you put that hole in, if you're not really very, very gentle, uh, once you're uh, <clears throat> hollowing out on the inside, because it's fairly easy to hollow the inside, it'll snap that tenon off real quickly. But I found if it's a solid tenon, it, it's less likely. Not that it can't happen. Now, how do I get the tenon off? I use a jam chuck and I just put some foam on it, put that in my headstock, and then part off the tenon. All right, so that's the body of it. And there's the finished body. Now for the, uh, the finials, again, because this is about three inches, I typically uh, keep my tenons about three and three eighths to three and a half inches in length. And again, I still use, you know, I still use the, uh, the golden ratio typically to lay it out. Uh, one of the things that you will notice as well there are two tenons on this finial. And this stuff will be up here. You can come and look at it. There's two tenons on the finial. One that's in the diameter of the whole light rail. And then one that extends up. And then in the bottom of my top finial, I've drilled the hole. So when I put it on, it aligns, it stays. Okay, so I've used two tenons. Questions, any questions at all? Steve, I've, I've got one question about the gold ratio. On those, on those dome finials, yes. dome, dome, dome uh, ornaments. Yeah. No, uh, not the, on the half dome, I'm sorry, not the, like the ones you're right. showing. The umbrellas. The umbrellas. Bottom finial, where does the golden ratio start? Does it start where I see it or right at no, the top in, no, inside? Where it, where it touches inside here. It so it's the whole finial inside here. Okay. Now, you've brought up a good, another good observation, and that is unless it hangs high on a tree or on high in a display, you're not going to see part of that unless I didn't bring any along. Uh, but again, if you take, yeah. if you take this and tilt it when you're turning the outside figure or the outside shape, you're going to get a finial that actually sits open, or a, a body that sits open, so that you can see the finial better. Let's see if there's any questions in the room. We're at a break point there. I'm just going to the gallery view for a second. Anybody out there in the Zoom land with a question? Okay. Get the last, um, last thing that I'll just share with you here, and I know I had a couple questions earlier. Um, also, when I'm making the top finial, um, the loop that I put on it comes from a, a fishing hook. Um, anywhere from an, uh, number eight to a number 10, number six, it really doesn't matter. Uh, their thicknesses on the shank are pretty much similar. And I use a 65, a number 65 drill. So before I take this off the lathe, this is another hint or key. Before you drill it, take your pale stock, with your cone center and just bring it up and lightly score that to get a seat, it's just like a center punch in a piece of metal to, to start the area where that small drill is going to start so it doesn't wiggle on you. 
and then and drill it. And I simply then will cut the fishing hook off and glue it in with super glue. Now, I did have some questions earlier and I'll answer them now before I go back. And I'm gonna share with you not how to do all this, but how to, to do the uh, finials. Um, a couple of folks had asked me about uh, what abrasives do I use? There's a lot of different sources, but I get, I, and I've tried a lot of different abrasives. The ones that I like the best, that work the best, that keep uh, the grains on the abrasive uh, sharper, longer, um, come from Norton. Norton Dry Ice. And you can get that at um, Sanding Glove. Sanding Glove, the sandingglove.com. Um, and the other source that I like is uh, Cling Sport. They have several places. Um, North is North Carolina is, is one of the sources. And one of the things are <clears throat> the two different types that I like the best, I prefer. They have what they call the blue and the green. The green you can use with water as well. So you can use it dry or wet. Now you're gonna say, when do you ever use wet? Trust me, most, most of the bowls and most of the things that I, I use, I, when I get up to six, eight, 12, 1500 grit, I'll squirt a little bit of water on it and it's incredible what it does. Um, but these two have come out of clean sport. Um, <clears throat> Norton also sells uh, just typical other abrasive paper. And the, generally the different grits, this is 120, comes in red, and these come in, in yellow, some come in blue, it depends on the grit. But I, I know this, Norton is a little bit more expensive. They last much, much longer for me though. So I spend the extra money. Just don't tell my wife what I spend. All right, any questions? All right. Um, I'll explain this out here so you can hear a little better behind and behind the screen. Uh, when I start a finial, I'll typically again make it square. And I typically start with at least, all right, at least one inch square and generally about five inches, five and a half inches, okay? And I use, and you'll see, I use a, a spigot jaw on my chuck so I can grip, clear out the here for added stability when I turn unsupported end of the finial. You're gonna see, I'm gonna start out supported to begin to keep it from vibrating. So it's pretty, um, so it stays centered pretty well. And then as I go, I'll work back thinner and thinner and thinner, but I'll work back uh, <clears throat> toward the uh, headstock. Again, one of the other things that you'll wanna really, really look at is the direction of the grain. Now, again, if you're gonna start and try to do a finial, a thin finial, my recommendation is this. Um, get a piece of wood that has grain that is pretty much, it looks like a line is going right across when you cut it, okay? This is a piece of the dupe. And again, this section of it actually happened to have nice straight lines on the grain. I'm gonna turn a piece of blue beach tonight. Um, and again, you can see also that that's, that's pretty, 
well. Questions about this? Uh, again, the other thing that I do, I think I heard Mike say he's pretty fussy. I'm pretty fussy when I do this. Um, that my, You're Mike, right? I'm Thomas. I'm sorry, Tom. Bad memory. Mike Thomas. Mike uh, he's Thomas. pretty particular as well, you told me. I'm the better good looking one. Though. <laughs> but Just I like remember, his. when you see the good looking one, that's Thomas. Okay. Uh, one of the things I do is I will mark the center accurately from both ends and center punch it. You're going to say, why do you center punch it? I'm going to hold it between centers. I'm going to chuck it up. You'll see in just a moment. Uh, if you don't have any questions, I'm going to go back. Yes, sir. I have a question. And that is, uh, if you know that your video is going to wind up having a major diameter of like, say, five eighths of an inch or even a half yes. inch. Great question. Why start that much bigger? Great, great question. Why would you suspect? If you just had a, I guess for the stiffness, the stability, people would like to start. And some of my videos I use that are, you know, like an inch or a half inch by half inch or three quarters by three. This is three quarter by three quarter. You have to use a lot of patience because of the stability of this. Even though you grip it out to here, it's not as stable as a larger piece. It's it's, uh, per, it's similar to turning. Uh, the inside of, or hollowing the inside of a bowl. You hollow the outside or the inside. You don't hollow the center of the bowl deeper than the edges of the bowl. You will get more stability if you turn from the outside toward the center. If you hollow and get down to the thickness that you want and leave that mass in the center, the stability of that hole will be much better. And that's why I do it. That's what I found from, you know, experience. You, you, you folks are probably better turners than I am, so you, uh, you know. Any other questions? I, I think you're going to like to turn Blue Beach. If you ever get Blue Beach, even though it looks like it has grain, the grain direction goes in both directions. And it's just incredible when you turn. Now, when I begin, when I begin, I'm going to take a look at the end grain or the uh, side grain of the wood. Remember, I said it should be pretty parallel. Have you ever noticed wood that has little arrows in it on the side grain? You should sometimes. Um, that arrow, all right, if you see little arrows or grain. In with you will want that arrow to point toward the headstock. If your lines go uphill, right, you'll want the lines to go in the opposite direction to begin because I'm going to put a tendon on the end that I'm really going to put in the headstock once I begin turning. So I'm going to take a look at this. In fact, looks like the lines are going this direction. Turn it now and turn back toward the headstock. What would I be doing to the, to the grain? Pulling it up, it'd be tearing. So if I turn it around and go toward the headstock, the grain or that wood's going to lay down for it. So again, the direction that grain is really, really important. Uh, by the way, the uh, I did buy an adapter for. I have a chuck that's. Uh, a one and a quarter inch by 
eight. This slate is one inch by two. I'm not going to put that in the whole way into the cup. I forgot my cone center. I typically will use a cone center. I'm going to use a small cone in this cup center uh, just to align it. Now, one of the other things that you'll want to do, which is another tip, and I don't know how you align your tools. You have a cup center uh, with a point on it. If you have a cone center with a cup on it, align that cup center, align that cup center so that the cutting, mop cutting part of your tool is aligned right with the center. In other words, right on center is where you want to line or have the height of your tool rest. When I did that earlier, I put a, a, a hose clamp on it. So now I can turn it around. I don't have to worry about it dropping or adjusting and so on. I typically will start I will round the corner from my party tool, put a little shoulder on it, and I straighten that up. I want to make certain that the contact is uh, 
circuit jaws are in con pretty much full contact. Then I'll reverse it. <laughs> Must have been Axel waking up. Okay, that's the mundane part of it. Well, all of it's mundane, I guess. So. particular uh, quarter inch gouge, I have a triple bevel on it so I can get in much closer. Finish the end. I'm going to finish this, uh, the finial end here.
I'll finish off uh, making uh, the bottom real pointed. All right, so there's the bottom of the finial. Now I start to work back. I really should turn the lathe off, but I'm gonna measure. Simply start making that now. Notice most of the time I'm working from headstock to tailstock. Now, can you all hear? You'll notice there's about an inch there. At this point, I'll, I'll typically, I'm not gonna sand tonight, but I will typically sand about an inch at a time and finish sand it before I continue. Um, again, put the lathe in reverse to sand. Now, when you sand also, you can take just a bit off to make it thinner as well, but I like to take most of it off when I'm turning. Thank you. 
I'm going to lay out a, uh, a bead. All right, once I've got it finished, that needs to be a little deeper. I'm going to use the parting tool now to put the tenons on it. <clears throat> and again, I have calipers set for the large hole in the bottom of that uh, finial base.
Now, the length of that finial is going to be determined by the thickness of this. It's about an eighth of an inch. Now, at this point, one of the things I do before I put that tenon down to finish size, I'll use this parting tool. It's made out of a hand saw blade. It's very thin. I'm going to recess the back of that finial out, the finial base, so it fits on that curvature of the Again, this all should would have been sanded as I, one of the other things that you do not want to do is sand up against where your transitions are. You want to make certain they're, shape, they're sharp. So sand and then go back and then just give it a slight pair so that it keeps them sharp. Before I do anything else, I'll put a coat of finish on it. I typically use lacquer. And again, <clears throat> I spin it in the reverse direction to put it on. I uh, use lacquer and put a coat of lacquer on it, very thin coat, and then part it off. And once I put all the pieces together, glue them together, I then put a final finish coat of spray lacquer on it. Questions? Barry. Does the situation ever come up where it's advantageous to use like a, a nylon hollow cone on the tailstock to support, like if it starts to whisk or something like that? You know, I've, you, you can do that. In yeah. fact, I have, uh, I, I have two small polypropylene cones that I, I used when I first started and it got to be a bother for me. 
So the technique that I just showed you is the one that I found to be the best for me. Whatever works for you, use it. You know, just because I showed you a way, that's, that's the way that I'm comfortable with. But if you're not comfortable with it, and again, did you hear the noise when I was turning? You can tell by the noise how much vibration you're going to get in this thin part. The higher the squeal, the more whip, as you say, is, is in that piece. What speed were you turning at? The faster, the better. I usually turn. Uh, this lathe doesn't go up that far. Um, I usually turn about 2,300 to 3,000 RPMs. Okay. Um, this, I suspect, was probably around 900, just an estimate from what I felt. Which is okay, but again, um, <clears throat> the pressure is is one of the key points when you're coming from tail stock to head stock. Very gentle touch, just to clean up the kind of to ensure that you get a nice even diameter. It's not as hard as it looks. Other questions? Thank you for letting me present. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder that the next month is the uh, Inside Out Turning Challenge. And um, on the 16th of December, is the Malcolm Xander piercing demonstration. That's the Thursday, it's 10 a.m. And we'll be having our club cleanup uh, January 22nd at 10 a.m. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we'll see you again in January. Hey, a few guys left, a few guys awake. You guys all good? Yep. Yeah. 99.